Hello everyone, welcome back to episode 2 of Night Call. So last time we left off before we could take a look at all the files that we got from Detective Bousset, I think that's her name. So I guess if, let's just go over every one of these files that we just got and let's see what we can do with those. Hold to investigate. Wait a second, what? Oh, okay, so you just... Okay, so you just hold them and it automatically analyzes stuff. Oh, okay, and that takes up time up there. Okay, so there's a killer case that would also be necessary to be looked at. And the photos take a little bit of... take a little bit less time. Is there something else here too? No, doesn't seem like it. I guess it would be the best to just start and take a look at everything. So, let's take a look at this case file. It takes a long time, but we will definitely need, like, the basic information, right? And then just take a look at all the pictures. Okay, so now these are all added new clues. Huh, so this will take up a lot of time as well. Picture of crime scene three. So what can we do here? Okay. Okay, so these are our five suspects. Okay, that's interesting. What is this? Death is execution. That's what a cop said. So do we know anything? Okay, so here we have Paul-Marie Fragonard, 169, retired cop, joined the police in 1977, divorced from a judge, born in the French Antilles, moved to mainland France in 1976. Okay, so he's a retired cop, divorced from a judge. Uh, she's a ex medical examiner, 180 in size almost, uh, escaped from Argentina when she was young, lost her parents to Argentinian junta, the process. Claudia Campos. This is Arve Greyou, 1 meter 77, homeless man with an unknown background, briefly worked for Charles Bougrain, victim 2 in the 90s. Got health issues after Rick Toad and health scandal, a couple of arrests for breaking and entering. Mm -hmm. So who was Charles Bougrain, I wonder. Will, will we be able to take a look at anything more? Pictures of crime scene too. You deserve this. Killer's height is under 1 meter 80, so that would be... That's be that would be all of them. Okay, he's a well-known lawyer from saint Wen, Defender on the Duar, case defender of several molested kids in poor neighborhoods. Was a promising football player when he was 10. Message on crime scene justice. Okay, so they think that it could be this guy because he's a lawyer, just because it read justice. But what does this say here? Protected by a son one mayor, and he is from there. The killer's height that actually matches all of them. Oh, we didn't read this guy. Pierrot Batas, cop in Paris. That was a cop, financial affairs, died two years ago. Mom got health issues after Rick told an health scandal. Gay in a relationship, never disclosed this information at work. So this Rick told an health scandal affected two people. This guy, who got health issues, and this guy whose mother died because of it. No, she, no, her, his mother didn't die. He's still, she's still alive, but she also have health issues. So these two are connected because of uh, just Rick Toad and health scandal. Okay, she is only a suspect because she's shorter than 180, but only by a millimeter. He is a suspect because the weapon was a rare gun used in the 70s. Okay, and this one... Yeah, okay. These two have the health issues. And this guy is a lawyer. Well, I mean, I would say that, that those are just suspicions, maybe. Or ideas why. But I think that, like, the message on the crime scene, this whole justice... This doesn't really necessarily have to be a lawyer, right? Can I just take a closer crime? It doesn't know. It's just the same. Okay. What do we have here? Okay, so the killer knew the victims or researched them. Okay, the killer left messages and chalk on first three crime scenes. That doesn't really give us any victims killed with one bullet in the neck. 
No sign of violence. Heard in your taxi? Really? When did I hear that? Okay. But I'll take it. So, it seems like looking at the board doesn't take up any time, so that's okay. Then, let's just investigate this one too. Okay, now we have a new clue. Let's take a look what it is. Oh, wait. Message on crime scene three. Time's up. How does this escape from Argentina? How does this adds to her. He was connected to this. He killed a left message in chalk on first three crime scenes. I don't know, was chalk something? No, no sign of violence. Two cops said that. I mean, he is, no, don't, yes, he is a cop in Paris. He is a retired cop. Okay, so maybe this is, there's like not really too much to see for us now at this point. Maybe we need to, we need to get to know a little bit more. So let's just end the night. I mean, we had some, we made some good use of our time, I guess, reading all the documents. So let's end it for tonight. And let's do this, let's do the next night. With a heavy hand, you wipe your tired face. You open the sofa bed and lie down. The events of the day run through your head. The streets, the passengers, their faces, their problems. Your brain is running at full speed, your body aches and you're in pain. You can tell you need to get more sleep. You glance at your investigation board. It looks awfully empty, tomorrow you'll have a chance to fill it up more. You shake your head and your mind wanders for a second. A second later, you're asleep. I hope I remember all those names. If they come up in a, in a conversation. We'll see. You open one eye. Your attention turns to shouting upstairs, a door slamming, typical. You get up quickly. And a few minutes later, you're outside of your studio. Okay, night two, here we go. So who's next? Oh. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, there's like a lot to choose from. And what's this? So who looks like we would want to transport him? This is complicated. Let's take her. I don't know. We don't need to go to a gas station yet. So let's see. The passenger who's entered your cab slams the door and stares at you intently. Um, let's just start with good evening. Are you kidding? That's how you want us to start? Do we know each other? I don't know. I'm not sure I follow. No, I'm not sure I follow. <laughs> Naturally. But of course. If I were to say to you... Her voice is slightly raspy with an oddly metallic sound. October 27th. That's the date. The night of the attack. The night you... Could this woman be the judge? Oh, I hope not. 10.46 p.m. And no, the attack took place later. Does that ring a bell? You nod your head. Um, answer? I don't know what I'm remembering. Yes, it does, miss. Don't you miss me? Not another word. She waggles an accusing finger at you. Last October 27th, you were in this very cab, driving a fare, and you committed a crime. That's right, sir, a crime. What the hell? Uh, interrupt her? Listen. Her voice goes up a notch. Believe me, you don't want to interrupt me. I spent the whole day working like an idiot for that rotten newspaper. Do you have any idea what I do for a living? Down crier, no. Um, I don't know. Teacher, lower your eyes, say nothing. Lower, lower your eyes, I don't know. I'm a sub editor, Mr. Uh, taxi driver. I correct mistakes that a bunch of moron journalists make. 
There isn't a single one, not one, who knows how to write a proper sentence. I had it, really had it. On the night of October 27th, you cut me off. <laughs> what the hell, really? She was in another car then? Um, uh, okay. I'm... I couldn't care less. I'm simply telling you my story, my problem. You, you cut me off the night of the accident. I almost died that night. She grinds her teeth, you shudder. I crashed my car, my boyfriend's car, that is. The same guy who made yet another comment about women drivers. The neighbors called the police that night, I made such a scene. To think the guy there is called himself a feminist. She pauses for dramatic effect as a disturbing smile spreads over her face. Oh, let's just say nothing. Her voice is suddenly noticeably quieter, almost fragile. The next day, no more boyfriend. No more car. I messed up a job interview with a major news outlet. A paper where people know how to write, where they follow basic rules of French grammar. Imagine for just a minute. I could have stopped correcting copy for a bunch of morons. She takes a deep breath. But all because of you, because of your cap. Everything changed the night of October 27th. A sad faraway look comes over her. My life has never been the same. But her voice, her voice is bursting with fury and hatred. Forced to go live with my mother while I went apartment hunting in this rotten city where tiny studios cost an arm and a leg. So I started looking for you. The back of your neck breaks into a sweat. You can feel cold, clammy droplets about to drip down your spine. Oh wow, really? Is she the murderer? Did she tried to kill us because we cut her off one year ago. I started asking around. I bribed one of your colleagues into giving me your number. A droplet of sweat starts sliding down your back. Then I found your address. Your first one, that is. You shiver as the drop reaches your boxers. But that's your business. What matters is I did eventually get your other address. The real one. The, drop the droplet has reached your tailbone. You've started shaking. At first, I admit I was planning on going to your place. She shrugs her shoulders. Her voice has softened a little. Just maybe to spit in your face or something like that. And then I thought to myself, no, Ludovine, maybe the guy deserves a chance. You never know. So you're going to apologize. Go on, give it your all. Take your time. Take a deep breath. She breathes in deeply, then exhales. Like that. Uh, you know, just tell her about the attack. I mean, she's a journalist. She might know something. Tell her about the attack. I'm sorry, but I don't remember that night. Not memorable enough, huh? Uh, no, I've forgotten what happened that night. She freezes. A few minutes after I met you, I was... I was attacked. Attacked by the judge, the serial killer. It's you. You survived. Yeah. A host of conflicting feelings flicker across her face. Doubt, surprise, anger, the desire to slap you. Hey, come on! Then she falls back against the car seat, all her anger somehow gone. I, I didn't know. The police wanted to keep it all a secret. I didn't see the killer's face and he didn't see mine. For my own protection, for my peace of mind. The newspaper where I work, they're looking for you. We have a reporter looking for you. The last few months have been difficult for you. R really difficult. Um, we... <laughs> she didn't even know if you told us where she goes. So we were just standing around. <laughs> nice. Um, shall we apologize now? Are you, are you going somewhere? No, you know what? Let's just apologize. That's the right thing to do. Uh, I'm still sorry. Even if I don't remember everything, even though I was attacked, it doesn't change anything about it. You can't find the right words, maybe because you imagine for a moment and normal night how things should have been. Passengers, rides in Paris, a tourist heading to Mauritius or something. And you, your cigarettes, cheap packs of beer, the little radio next to your bed. Your passenger clears her throat. She's noticed your mind is elsewhere. Thanks. All her anger has evaporated. No more looks that could kill simmering rage or grinding teeth. 
my boyfriend was a jerk anyway. And then this job, maybe it wasn't so great. She gives you a little smile. I tend to get all worked up about things. You noticed. <laughs> True. Sometimes I take things a little too far. That too. In Paris, I guess we are quick to forget about being nice to each other, about being polite, and for a taxi driver, you're a real sweetheart. She gives a short laugh. This is what I suggest. I'm going to exit the cab. No, don't. I'm going to go for a little walk in the cold to get my mind off things. And then when I get home, I'll destroy all the information I have on you. Is that okay with you? That would be okay with me, but it's okay. Okay, if you, if you stay and tell me something about the murder case? Thank you. This word echoes for a minute through the taxi. Your passenger reaches for the door. The door opens and closes. You're alone in the taxi, your head spinning slightly as if you'd had a drink. Just one, but something really strong. You briefly try to remember that night. Nothing. Nothing but a vague impression of something behind you. The killer silhouette. A fleeting presence. You shake your head. There's nothing more than before. If only you had turned around, everything would have been easier. If you had seen the face of... All at once you start the cab. That didn't take up a lot of time. We didn't even go anywhere. So, who's next? Maybe you. Okay, he doesn't want to talk anything, but maybe that's a good thing, because then, you know, he can tell us something, perhaps. You double park and wait for your next passenger to slide into the back seat. He looks at you like he appreciates you and your taxi. He gives you his address. You start driving. A few words are exchanged, the weather, taxes, traffic. Then you can tell it's coming, the, ine the inevitable conversation about the killer. Some bits of information, rumors, things overheard. You make a mental note of what you've heard. Who knows, it might come in handy. Your passenger doesn't make a sound for the next few minutes of the trip. It doesn't bother you, you have enough on your mind. What clue did I just get? Your investigation, the judge, Pousset. You're overcome with a craving to smoke. You nod slowly and glance at your passenger. Calm and still, he seems far away. Um, everything okay? Uh, yes, thank you. He slowly turns his head towards you and gives you an odd look, like he's disappointed you're talking to him. He watches you closely for another minute and turns back to look out the window. You keep your eyes on the road. The silence becomes heavy. All of a sudden, you feel a strange sense of camaraderie with your passenger. You look at him quickly in the rearview mirror. He doesn't look familiar at all, and yet it's like you know him. Is he my killer? A second later, an outside light shines on his face at a weird angle. It looks like he's smiling. A few seconds later, you drive down his street. He straightens up a bit. You park in front of the number he gave you. His pace is fair without a word. No! The door opens slowly and he smiles at you. You can tell it comes from the bottom of his heart despite how uptight he is. You're really a swell guy. You weren't expecting that. <laughs> By the time you collect your thoughts, your passenger is already far away. He disappeared into a building. A moment goes by before you turn the key in the ignition. Oh no. I thought that he would give me some info or something. I mean, she looks like a lady who knows stuff, who would like to gossip. Hopefully. Oh wait, there was someone right in my face. Ah, oh, damn it. Heading home. Oh well, that's a long drive, so that's a lot of money at least. The passenger who enters the cab is a regular. Ooh. Her name is Ade. She, 
Pada, eight. She's a psychic who occasionally goes home by cab. Oh, a psychic. Uh, okay. Can you tell me who my killer is? She slips into the back seat, her earrings jingling softly. She smiles and gives you her address. You start the engine. You know. She's wa waiting for you to look up at her in the rearview mirror. I did a reading for you, for your story. Um, what story? The serial killer. Don't play dumb with me, kiddo. She does a playful imitation of your what story. You're so cute when you pretend I don't know all about you, what you're up to. Her voice takes on a softer, more serious note. You're crazy about Ade, but times like these, when she acts like she's your mother, really get to you. And what do the cards say? An almost imperceptible smile flickers across her face. Round one, Ade. I don't know if it's Ade or Aid. I don't know, I'm just stick with Ade. Well, I drew cards for the judge. His name is related to one of the cards. Judgment, which suggests understanding and open-mindedness, an element of unpredictability, too. But I didn't draw judgment, I drew the sun. It's a positive card, it represents warmth and success, happiness. She nods her head. Whoever this killer is, it's not about money, it's more of a kind of... The word may seem strange, but I see it as a kind of consecration. It's about success, a job well done. Uh, that could point to the lawyer, right? He or she, by the way. I don't know why. I sense there is something feminine in the draw. I... Oh, I'm sorry. None of this is very useful, is it? Everything is useful. Go on. Every bit of information counts, really. She watches closely you for a moment, her head dipping slightly. When this whole business is over, will you come round for dinner with us some night? Us? Yes, us, me and the boys. I think it's time to start over. What do you say? That's a good idea. Great. I think the kids are dying to see you. They've been asking all kinds of questions. Okay. For the time being, you just have to take care of yourself. You give her a smile, hoping it won't spark any further discussion. It doesn't, much to your relief. Sometime later, you turn onto Ade Street, a row of identical detached houses, utterly soulless, colorless. You pull up to her gate. They know you drop me off from time to time. You could come inside tonight, right now, you know. You avert your gaze. I mean, no, you're right. You do what you have to do. Call me when you get the chance. Adi leaves the vehicle in a hurry, her footsteps sounding on the flagstones as she walks over to her house. The door to her house slams shut. You turn the key in the ignition. You have to get out of there now. She didn't give us any tip? Hey, I thought you liked us so much. It's not nice. Okay, but that gave us some clues. So, a job well done. Hmm, I don't know. It could be the judge, but it, I mean, it could also be a cop. I don't know. Hmm, where to go next? 